and move into our discussion on the ethical and legal challenges associated with integrating AI into healthcare. And we will hear from Glenn Cohen. Glenn is the faculty director at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics, and a deputy dean of the Harvard Law School. Glenn is one of the world's leading experts on the intersection of bioethics and the law, as well as health law, and his current work focuses on the areas of medical AI, health information technologies, and research ethics. We're so grateful to have Glenn with us today. Glenn? Thank you so much. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Next slide, please. Title slide. I often say that my job is to bring the doom and gloom because I'm dual trained as a lawyer and as an ethicist. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some of my disclosures and conflicts. Next slide, please. I want to just start by kind of giving you an overview about how I think about how legal and ethical issues creep up into algorithm design and particularly for machine learning. And I often think about this as the phases necessary for building one of these models and the idea that there are issues that arise at each of the stages of the life cycle. So first, in the first phase, acquiring the data among the issues, where does the data come from? Are you getting consent from the patients whose data you are using? How are you stripping identifiers? Is that sufficient? How representative is the data? Is the data diverse and racial in other ways to serve the needs and context in which it will be deployed? What kind of governance opportunities are you offering patients? In the second phase, building and validating the model. How do you know when a model works well enough that it can be used on real patients? What standards of validation should be put in place? Who's going to be doing the validating? and How do we know we should trust them? How do you balance intellectual property protection in the form of trade secrecy against transparency needs to make sure these things are actually working? In the third phase, testing the model in real world settings. What, if anything, will patients be told about the fact that AI is being used to partially direct their care or reimbursement? Do you need a separate informed consent for this? Can patients opt out? How do we handle liability? I'll come back to both of those in a moment. And which regulator or combinations of regulators are best fitted to oversee uh, this area? And finally, the last phase, broad dissemination. It's great. You've got a model that actually works. It's helping patients. And now you have a question about whether it's being equitably used. So do all patients who contribute data to the building of the model get its benefit? Um, how do you make it commercially viable while also ensuring that there's equitable access? Next slide, please. So I mentioned this uh, already in terms of uh, liability, but I wanna emphasize at the outset that there's been shockingly few cases about liability for medical AI. And most of the ones we've actually seen have been about surgical robots, where arguably it's not really the AI that's causing the distinctive issues. Now, it's possible there's a large gap between what we observe in the reported cases and what's actually going on. Maybe there's a lot of settlement. That's possible, but in general, my own takeaway and what I would leave you with is that people probably overestimate the importance of liability issues in this space given the data. But still, we should try to understand it. So this is a paper I did with uh, Gurkha and Price in JAMA. And essentially, we're looking and working through an AI recommendation to a physician, whether the physician adopts it, and the idea that it either harms or does not help the patient as much as what the physician would have recommended in the absence of AI assistance. And the question we're interested in is, who's liable when that happens, when there's an adverse event? Even when medical AI works well, it's not infallible. Sometimes patients will be injured as a result. And in general, in the US, to avoid medical malpractice liability, a physician has to provide care at the level of a competent physician within the same specialty, taking into account available resources. So we call the standard of care. What happens when you introduce an AI algorithmic recommendation as part of that process? And the figure we have here represents possible outcomes for a very simple toy case so we're imagining a binary, and AI recommends the drug and dosage for a patient with ovarian cancer. And if you assume the standard of care would be to administer 15 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks of the chemotherapeutic agent, the AI, for a particular reason, for this particular patient, recommends a larger dose. We examine essentially in this paper what could happen in terms of liability, depending on what happens next. And I guess the takeaway I really want you to have is that last column with the color coding, it's stop sign color coding, so red, yellow, green. 
Under current law, a physician faces liability only when she or he does not follow the standard of care and an injury results. Those are the red boxes in the figure. And what's important about that analysis is it's just that the uh, implication for physicians is as long as they follow the standard of care, they're going to be okay. And thus the safest way to use medical AI from a liability perspective is as a confirmatory tool to support existing decision-making processes rather than as a source of a way to improve care. So I was gonna do it anyways, the AI told me to do it, and I'm very happy about this. Well, that might be comfortable for physicians who are seeking to avoid liability, but it's terrible news for medicine because it's precisely in the cases where the standard of care is inappropriate, and the AI tells us so, but that's the cases where there's actually an advantage to using the AI and the possibility that will actually do better. And so that's a real problem with the current design of liability. There may come a time when it becomes actually liability risking not to use AI because AI becomes the standard of care, but we're not there yet. And we're happy to talk more during the Q&A about hospital liability, about developer liability. But now if I can move on to the next slide, please. And that is questions about informed consent. Do patients have a right to know about AI's involvement in their care and under what circumstances and what details? So suppose to use a case study from reproductive medicine, you're a patient undergoing in vitro fertilization, you have multiple embryos, you're deciding which to implant. Your physician recommends a particular embryo and gives you some reasons to do so. It turns out though that your physician doesn't disclose they arrived at this decision in part based on a machine learning system which recommends this embryo based on molecular imagery, analysis of your personal characteristics, and other factors. Is it a problem that your physician hasn't told you that was the basis in part for the decision? What if the physician actually chooses to overrule, quote unquote, an AI system recommendation and the physician fails to tell you that? Have they violated your rights of legal or ethical informed consent? Come to think of it, when you last saw your own physician, do you know whether an AI or ML system was used and involved in the care decision making. I have on this slide a paper we just did a couple months ago on a mental health chatbots for adolescents, where some players have used generative AI to help generate responses or at least suggest responses. There's actually a famous case in Belgium where a AI chatbot encouraged a man to end his life, and unfortunately, tragically, he did. Is that the kind of thing patients have a right to know that AI is being involved in? They're dealing with an AI. Is this like failing to tell a patient? that a substitute surgeon is scrubbing in, which our case law tells us is a violation of informed consent, or is it more like failing to tell your patient that the reason you recommended a particular course of action was because of this black box up here, which included your memories from a case you saw in residency, a lecture you vaguely remember from medical school, and the last 10 patients you saw that were somewhat similar that are influencing your thought process. What is the right way to think about how AI works here and our duties to disclose? And by the way, that little cute seal on the slide is Paro, the therapeutic robot. He's sometimes used with patients in declining cognition due to age, and he's cute and he's cuddly and they love him and they treat him like a pet, but he's also a little spy because he reports back all sorts of information to physicians. How do we handle the kinds of cases involving Paro, which have vulnerable populations that may not understand even if we tell them the limits of what we're doing here. Next slide, please. So where does the data to train models come from? A lot is from EHRs. Is it a problem we don't explicitly ask patients to share their data? And this is not just a theoretically interesting question. The University of Chicago and Google were recently sued in a class action, alleging that they released patient EHR data with a timestamp that was otherwise de-identified but it allowed Google, with its ability to geolocate patients based on phone data, to actually re-identify patients and that violated HIPAA. There are many such lawsuits going on right now. I'm actually an expert witness in a couple of them. And next slide, please. The problem with the US approach to uh, health privacy is it's very sectoral. HIPAA demonstrates one of the problems with that approach. HIPAA attaches and limits data protection to traditional healthcare relationships and environments. But the reality of the 21st century is that HIPAA covered data forms a small and diminishing share of the health information stored and traded in cyberspace, as we try to show with this figure. Most of the stuff is below the waterline. And to put the point more forcefully, in the future, the data that best predicts our health may not be healthcare data, 
but instead data about our social media presence, online shopping, et cetera, et cetera. In one particularly fascinating illustration, a study used machine learning to try to diagnose depression from Instagram posts and showed that Instagram posting habits, filter choice, and changes of that was actually a very good predictor of depression, much better than many people would have complicated. And while most of the data privacy discourse thus far has focused on patient privacy, one very important to think about is about what the way it reveals a lot about physicians. How well are they doing their jobs? Are we reimbursing them appropriately? Is there problems with their practice style? So it's not just patients that may feel surveilled, but also our physicians. Next slide, please. So I know the foundation is going to have an entirely different session on equity and bias, so I'll just whet your appetite for it. We can chat more during Q&A. What I want to suggest is that the problem is actually much worse than you think. Uh, most people think of, okay, well, the data set uh, is not very representative of the population. I often joke as a mid-40s white guy in Boston, I'm dead center in most data sets used to train medical AI. Not so for women uh, who are over 60, who are African-American living in the rural South. And so often people think, okay, well, the problem is that the app has not been trained on the right data set. And, you know, that is a major problem, but it's one to wrap your head around. It's not that hard. Hard to fix, easy to conceptualize. The problems that we can't see that are much trickier, and Ziad Abelmari was mentioned before as one of the recipients of funding, he has this great paper that I have over here on the slide, one of the best done and most famous examinations. And what they show is they take a hospital readmission algorithm that's widely in use, meant to find patients most in need of follow-up care during discharge, and they show it favored white patients over black ones at the same level of sickness. Why? Not because the data set wasn't representative, it's because there are differences in care delivery and care-seeking behavior between these populations that mean white patients are just much more expensive than black patients. To simplify, the algorithm was told to use health costs as a proxy for health state, which is a decent ex-ante design choice, but one that results in favoring white patients over similarly sick black patients. And this problem gets worse when you go beyond race, sex, age, which we can think about and try to train and try to test for, to think about all the other sources of variations in populations. But as I often say, it is true that medical AI often makes mistakes, cannot explain how it reaches conclusions, and is biased, but the same is true of your physician. So the real question is, how much of an improvement can we make on these scores by medical AI? And how do these errors distribute between populations we care about? Next slide. So this is my last substantive slide and I'll stop here. And that's just to say, as bad as I've made the problem sound, it's actually even worse than you think. Why? It's because what we call in this paper in Science and Elsewhere, uh, the update problem. Even if as a hospital system or a regulator, you check all this out, you're satisfied with all the answers, and that's true for the quote-unquote factory settings, we actually want algorithms to be adaptive, to learn out in the world and on the job, in part because every context, every hospital system, every patient population is quite different. We wouldn't want one that's trained only for patients that look like X to be used in a place where patients look like Y. But then you have the following problem. As a hospital system, as a regulator, when is it change so much that you need to re-review and how often do you do that? Now, FDA, which is really kind of very innovative in the space, is tr currently trying to get off the ground an approach called predetermined change control plants. Talk more about that in the Q&A. Very interesting, but I'm not entirely sure it's going to be an adequate solution, even if it's the best one we have. Next slide. And I'll just close by uh, thanking some of the people who funded this and thank you all for listening to me. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A. So thank you very much.